Hallelujah. I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. Prophecies have been made. Music has been played. Prophecies made already today. Hallelujah. How about that? Did you hear that? Prophecies have been made. Music has been played. We should say music has been played. Prophecies have been made already today. That'd be a song, wouldn't it? Music has been played, prophecies made already today. Oh, oh, and we're glad you came by this way. I want you to look again at John 17, 17. And let's look at that for a moment. John 17, 17. <clears throat> we're going to read it together. Sanctify them through thy truth, Jesus said, thy word is truth. Now, you don't have to be concerned any longer what truth is. You wonder, you know, Pilate asked, what is truth? Well, thy word is truth. His word is the truth. Hallelujah. John 8, 32, put that up there again. Amen. John 8, 32 says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now, this is the truth, but this won't make you free until you know it. You have to know the truth. It's the truth you know that makes you free. And notice it uses the word, this, this forceful word, make. It will make you free. The truth you know will make you free. Hallelujah. It don't make any difference what kind of chains, what kind of bondage, what kind of plots, what kind of schemes, what kind of plans the enemy has placed against you. Once you have a revelation of what God said about it, then the truth you know will make you free. Hallelujah. Now, I want to go over for a few moments to Matthew 16, Matthew, the 16th chapter, and... Um, I want to take a look at something just for a few moments. Matthew 16, hallelujah. In verse 13, and when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah's or one of the prophets. That's because it's like Christus said one time, he must have acted like these. And so he had, a, he had this bold side, this, this weeping side, this, this all this, he acted like the prophets. Now, watch this, because he was operating as a prophet under the Abrahamic covenant. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And that's really the thing that comes right down to it, isn't it? Who do you say Jesus is? Whom do you say he is? Whatever you say he is, he is to you. And if you believe that he is the only way, he is the Messiah, he is God in the flesh, and you believe that, and you say that, then your life should reflect that. Hallelujah. But what's sad is, is a lot of the church, a high percentage, did you know that a high percentage of the Christian world today believe that there is other ways to heaven besides Jesus? Did you know that? Now, that's, that's a real problem because Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. He didn't say Buddha was away, Mohammed was away, uh, Krishna was away. He didn't say all these other religions, these false religions are away. He said, I am the way. And it doesn't make any difference if you say he's not the way. See, this is where people are getting into all kinds of uh, just plain old crap today. It's because they have, and, and, and they're stirring it up and they're throwing it. Because here is the thing, you cannot believe as a, uh, it doesn't make any difference what you say, it doesn't change the truth. The truth is the truth, and this is the truth. 
You know, one minister was challenged by uh, a lot of people who, who held the Koran as the Bible, as the word of God, challenged him because he said the Bible was the word of God. And he told them to line up a hundred deaf people and they could pray for him in the name of Mohammed or whoever else they wanted to pray for him. And he would pray for him in the name of Jesus and whoever opened their ears was God. Well, they lined them up and they prayed and nothing happened just like prophets of Baal. And then suddenly he just stepped out and began to hit them on the ears and say in the name of Jesus in 95, I think it was 95 ears popped open instantly because he brought the truth on the scene. And it didn't make any difference if someone else said it wasn't true. See, we've got this, we've got this word today in society that is being said constantly. My truth, my truth. Well, your personal truth doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Your personal truth doesn't matter. The truth is what matters. See, you could have a personal truth, and this is what happens. They, they rewrite it. They, they, they hide the truth so they can rewrite their truth. And then from the rewritten truth, Krista calls the remix Bible, from the rewritten truth, suddenly you've developed your truth. And if you listen to people like Noah Harari talk about technology and all of this, how it's going to replace humans, flesh and blood, and, and all this kind of stuff, as if a keyboard can replace a spirit. I mean, you know, this is, this is the truth has been buried big inside a, a closet. If you really think the technology in a board or a guitar pedal, or an amplifier, or TV equipment can replace a human spirit? Why would you want to turn your human spirit over to a, a piece of carbon or non-carbon-based silicone? Why would you want to do that? Then you've got some bad sci-fi movie, The Borg. Resistance is futile. Then you got all this mess going on and people look at that and they start to look at that and they start to see this and they call it my truth. Before you know it, let's just say you say suddenly your truth declares gravity is not relevant anymore. That's your truth, your personal truth. I don't believe gravity is really relevant anymore. I, I, you know, I don't think it's true, and I don't think it applies to me. I live in technology now. I live in all of this, this a modern science world, so gravity is not really relevant to me because it's my truth. I mean, after all, you know, I, you may say, well, someone may say, well, because after all, you know, I'm five different genders. And so I'm five different genders and, and gravity doesn't apply to me. This is all my truth. I have built a hut and a world of my own truth. So since gravity don't apply to me anymore, I want to, I've always dreamed of soaring like a bird. And since it doesn't apply to me anymore, I'll just go up on top of a building and just jump off and soar like a bird. Because after all, I don't believe it applies to me. My truth says it doesn't. Oh, really? Well, okay, you will soar like a bird just long enough until you go splat on the ground. Because your personal truth did not matter when it came to the truth. It just didn't. And Christian people have got to be willing to go to the truth no matter where it takes them. Because Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And his word is truth and he is the word made flesh. So if you're going to operate in the truth, you know, I remember when uh, Kamala Harris was debating um, Mike Pence and he just destroyed her. I mean, just Every word out of his mouth just crumbled her arguments. And she kept saying, I just want the, the truth, the truth, the truth. He said, well, tell the truth. Well, you, you can't hide yourself from the truth because it's only the truth you know that makes you free. And so, you know, the church world has done 
a, a great injustice to the body of Christ. Now, I want you to see this. He said, and we'll continue reading now. He said, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed, this brought the blessing of heaven to you. What did? Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He heard a revelation from God about Jesus. He heard this revelation that his flesh and blood couldn't have told him. Flesh and blood said he was Jeremiah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. But the Father told him who he was, the Son of the living God, the Christ. And it's this revelation well, listen to what he said. He said, and I say also unto thee, in verse 18, thou art Peter, or Petros, or a fragment of a rock. What you just said made you rocky. It made you solid. And he said, and upon this rock, Petra, this huge Gibraltar boulder. I will build my church on the fact of revelation knowledge that I'm the Christ. He said, this is, once you get that, he said, that makes you solid. And he said, and on this revelation, I'm going to build my church. But then he says this, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell, there's five of them. They're your five physical senses. The five physical senses, if you live by that, it's what develops your truth. That's what assimilates your truth because it appeals. You'll hear things that appeal from the remix Bible, from the rewritten truth, you'll hear things that appeal to your carnal nature. And so that, that's just how people develop these kind of things. But he said, Jesus said, the gates of hell won't prevail against this truth. And whatsoever, listen to what he says, and I will give unto thee, verse 19, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Not the keys to the kingdom, the keys of it. You know, the janitorial staff can have a key to the bank, but the president has the keys of it. There's only certain places they can go, but not the president. He can go anywhere in that bank. So he said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, this was something he said, I'm going to give you revelation knowledge. This is the keys. You get revelation from the truth, from the word, and these revelations that God gives you, that flesh and blood didn't reveal to you, is going to open up every door that the kingdom of hell could try to close you up in. So we start to look at these certain keys. Keys. A key is a revelation from God. A key is revelation knowledge. Now, something the Lord said to me last night in the dark, well, actually early this morning, around 3 o'clock maybe, said people seem to have forgotten that the same evil that was still is. It has worn people down till they just get used to it. And somehow they think it will just go away. But it won't just go away. It has to be resisted. And the only way to resist that is with these keys. There's not a door built big enough that a key won't prevail against it. A key will open a door. I don't care how big it is. If it's got a lock on it, that key will open it. Now, we have to remember something. Religion has given the church a really bad example of God. It has. It's painted a picture of God so to the point that we just, we sing songs about how God is trying us, testing us, making us suffer, causing us pain, even bring sickness upon us to teach us a lesson. We have, we have absolutely, as religion has taught the body of Christ, how to suffer. 
It has taught us how to suffer. I remember when it was, uh, I believe it was an author, Anne Rice, that wrote years ago a book uh, about Memnock the devil. I think it was something to that effect. Some of you can check it out. And it was told that Satan revealed this, and in this story, however it went, I remember it was a write-up in the Birmingham News, and the story went this way, that Satan says in this writing, he says, uh, I knew God, and I was in heaven. And he said, and when God created man, man began to flounder around and suffer trying to trying to do well. And he said, I proposed to God. Now, this was in the story. Now, you got to remember this. This is something Satan is telling. He said, and I proposed to God to let me go down there and help them along their way and help their suffering. And God got mad and said, no, I want them to learn through suffering. And he said, me and God got in a fight over me wanting to help the people. And he kicked me out of heaven. And now I've been going to and fro in the earth trying to help people. Well, that's a very different view of what the truth says. The truth says he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, but he tells this other story. Well, when that appeared in the Birmingham News about this book, and she was signing this book and all that, I... I forget all the details around it, but I wrote a rebuttal to the Birmingham News, and it was called The Suffering Deception. See, because if you go along with this, now watch this. People say, well, God allowed me to suffer. God caused this pain in order to teach me something, and I'm learning, and I'm being perfected and pruned. Pruned. I'm being pruned. And tried by fire so that I may come out as gold. And they say things like this. And they talk about things like this. Well, now you and the devil have the same doctrine. Because that's what he said in that occultic book. So you and the devil would have the same doctrine. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want the same doctrine as the devil. There is certain things in the Bible called doctrines of devils. Well, and it says they're earthly, sensual, and devilish. They come from the devil. They operate in the five physical senses, and they're lodged in this earth. And it's your truth and your religious truth that embrace doctrines of devils. So if you believe God is allowing you pain in order to teach you something, then you and the devil have the same doctrine. And you don't want that. You don't want that. So where did the devil get such a doctrine? Ephesians 3.10. Put that on the screen. Let's see where he got such a doctrine as that. He would say, well, it's going, it's going a long time today, Brother Robert, on the 11th hour. It needs to be shorter. No, it probably needs to be longer. And watch this. In Ephesians 3, 10, I want you to put that on the screen. Hallelujah. It says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Notice who he's talking to, that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So, Spirit beings, demonic beings, and principalities and powers and things like that, they only know what they know about God from listening to the church preach. The church has preached a suffering doctrine. The devil picked it up so that you couldn't argue with him, and you, would, he would, you and him would agree. And so he starts preaching what the church is preaching. But this is not so. John 10, 10, let's put that on the screen. All this is kind of simple, I realize it. But let's put that on the screen and let's begin a journey. We won't maybe arrive there today, but we will begin today. It says that the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. Now, there is the thing the thief does. 
steals, kills, destroys. And he does them in that order. Steals, kills, and destroys. So you know Jesus is not the thief. But the thief came to do those three things. And if it, anything happening in your life has anything to do with those three things, then it's a thief doing it. So what does the thief come to steal? The revelation of the truth. He comes to take the truth away. The truth. Thy word is truth. You'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. So he comes to steal the truth steal the revelation, steal the word so that he can kill. And once he kills, then he destroys everything around it. But Jesus said, I am come. Now we know why the thief came. Now let's see why Jesus came. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So there's the two. There's the two list. That's the dividing line of the scripture. That's the dividing line between God and Satan. Stealing, killing, and destroying anything that fits that goes on Satan's side. Anything that has to do with life and more abundant life goes on Jesus' side. So choose life. Choose life that you and your seed may live. Hallelujah. So when Jesus asked his men, he said, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? He said, some say you're this, some say you're that. He said, but who do you say I am? That's what's going to change your life. Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Now watch this, and I'm going to have to bring this to a quick close, I think. Verse 20 in Matthew 16, verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus, the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Notice what he said. Who was it that was going to cause him suffering and pain? He said, the elders, the chief priest, and the scribes. Think about that. And be killed and be raised again. It said the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. That's who he's going to suffer many things from. Religion. Religion. The truth was looking at him in the face and they never even realized who he was. They're not even looking at who he is. The God himself is standing there staring at them, looking them in the eye. And they don't even recognize it. And they decided to beat God. They decided to make God suffer. They decided to try to drag him into their level. They wanted him to submit to their religious truth. To their truth that they had rewritten. Jesus told them once before, he said, you think you have, you have deliverance in everything Moses preached. And he said, yet he preached about me. So now religious elders, chief priests, even the scribes, all of them ganged up on him. The tradition of the elders, the priest and pastors teaching, and those who wrote the books. Everything was against him to make him suffer. The one who came to give life and more abundant life. So you can't preach freedom. And as soon as he said that, he said, but after three days, I'll rise again from the dead. Now, I've got to tell you this in close. He was operating on revelation knowledge. You have to remember that. When he came into the earth, he came into the earth as a prophet operating under the Abrahamic covenant. He didn't just come into the earth as God, even though he is God in the flesh, he didn't walk into the earth saying, I'm God, poof, and just make something disappear and something appear. He didn't just walk into the earth with that kind of uh, operating that way. 
he had to take it back legally the way Adam gave it away. He had to get it back as a man operating under the Abrahamic covenant as a prophet. And so he had to begin to learn these keys. Oh, I hope I'm getting through to somebody today. I, the keys of the kingdom. When he was 12 years old, he went to Jerusalem with his parents. Well, with his mother and his stepfather. He goes to Jerusalem, and they leave. He stays behind for three days. Now, this is all prophetic. The spirit of prophecy is any testimony about Jesus is the Holy, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost prophesying. So he stays back three days and nights in the temple. They come back, find him in the temple. After three days and nights, he'll be able to be found in the temple. So he goes back, and they go back to find him. And when they get there, they're astonished because he's listening to the priest and all teach, and he's teaching them. I get this understanding that he's probably correcting a lot of doctrine at 12 years old. And when, when Joseph said, did you not know that me and your mother are, 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 are uh, Mary said, did you not know that you, me and your father would be sorrowing after you? He said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So at 12 years old, he knew God was his father. He had already started correcting doctrine. And they were amazed at his wisdom and knowledge. So the Bible said when he left there, he left there and he had to grow. He made himself subject to Mary and Joseph. Then he had to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He's growing. He's learning and growing on each revelation God shows him. So he's walking at 12 years old. God is my father. God is my father. And he knows how to correct what they're saying about God. So then the day comes that they're at a wedding at Cana. And so the mother of Jesus was there in John chapter 2. The mother of Jesus was there. And it says that, they ran out of wine. So she comes to him and says they have no wine. Now you have to remember something. Now he's come off the mountain and he has faced every temptation. He knows who he is because when he got baptized, the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. In other words, this is the last Adam. His baptism was a sign of consecration to put it all back right to correct whatever Adam had done. And so you and I could come into the kingdom. So he goes to be, he goes into the wilderness to fast and pray and hear his father speak. And after the fast, the devil tempts him. And he tells him, tempts him on things he knows he can do. He said, if you're the son of God, command the stones to be made bread because Adam could do that. So it was a temptation. He overcomes everything, but when he comes off that mountain, and he comes back down preaching. Now watch this. He ends up at this wedding at Cana. They run out of wine. So now he's going to do his first miracle. First miracle. And he goes in there. And only the servants know what he's doing. And he fills up these, these stone jars. And he, with water, they fill them up. He faces no mind but his own mind. Him against the elements. Does he have authority over the elements? Nobody's challenging him. It's his own mind now. And so he stands there and says, fill them up with water. When they do, he says, now draw out of it and take to the governor of the feast. And they said it was the best wine, saved to last. Now the next time, after he has this conquered, he has a key, a key. Then he moves out, and the next time you find him, he's speaking to winds and waves. He's dealing with water again, and they obey him. He has his keys hanging them on his belt. 
The next time he's dealing with water, he walks across it. One is an ascension over the other. He moves into healing ministry. He heals uh, uh, Peter's wife's mother. He heals Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. He, he heals rotting flesh in a leper. He creates eyes when he spits on the ground. One is an ascension over another. He's growing in revelation knowledge. Then he comes on up to the last one. He's going to deal with death. J. Iris' daughter, dead a few minutes. The widow at Nain, her son, dead a few hours. Then Lazarus, dead four days. One is an ascension over the other. And then he begins to talk to his men. Whom do men say that I am? The son of man I am. Some say you're a prophet, Jeremiah. One of the prophets, he said, who do you say I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. My father told you that. He said, and after that, he said, I'm giving you these keys. And then he revealed something. I have defeated death over a few minutes, a few hours, and a few days. Now I'm going to, I'm going to defeat death once and for all. I am going to enter in. I am going to let religion kill me. Religion is going to, he said, between the elders, the priests, and the scribes, you'll suffer many things, and then he will die. He said, I'm going to enter death myself. And I'm going to go in there. Well, what beat him to death? What would beat a man to death? Elders, priests, and scribes. Well, the Romans killed him. No, sin. He became our sin. Nobody took his life. But he's going to suffer from elders, scribes, priests, and scribes. I believe that's what's causing the body of Christ to suffer today more than anything is elders, priests, and scribes. Every book we've got is about how bad God is. A majority of almost every book possessed in, in Christians' libraries tell them why they have to suffer. Yeah. It was passed down from the elders. Prophets come on the scene and elders stand up and try to make us sign petitions to say how we will prophesy. Yeah. Priests, pastors stand up and cater to every vomiting dog that throws up out in front of them so they won't have to close their doors. And scribes. I think that's what's causing the body to suffer more than anything. That's what's allowing governments to run roughshod like wild horses over the church. Who in the world would dare tell the church you're non-essential? Who would dare say such a thing to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of the living God? Well, who would dare say that? So he began to bear our sickness, carry our pain, and a lot of that came from elders, scribes, and priests. So he starts suffering so that you don't have to. And then he says, I'm going to die. I'm going to enter death. When he finally gives up his life, nobody took it. They tried to beat him to death. They couldn't. They couldn't do it. They couldn't kill him. He had to give his life. So he said, I'm going to be killed and enter in to death. And he said, there, I'm going to destroy it from the inside out. I'm going to destroy it from the inside out. And suddenly, Peter, the one who had the revelation, he's the Christ. Satan spoke through him. Not so, Lord. He said he took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine taking Jesus and saying, that's not true. That's not going to happen to you. Satan was scared. Jesus had already conquered all of these things. And now he saw in Revelation 
I'm going to destroy death once and for all. I'm going to take the power from it. Death, hell, and the grave. Not so, they said. But yet he did. And when he went into hell, on the cross, he paid the price for our sin. He endured the beating and the suffering of the elders, the priests, and the scribes. While he's hanging on the cross, they're telling him, if you're him, come down. You've missed it. You're wrong. And yet he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which interpreted means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He answered with scripture in, the other, in other tongues. I'm the fulfillment of the 22nd Psalm. And so he endured that. Then right after religion beat him like that, all sickness and disease began to come on him. You think about that. Think about the order of how it happened. And then he becomes our sickness and our sin. He who never committed a sin. There was no sin in him. He never committed not one. Not one word wrong. Not one action wrong. No sin, none, so that he could trade places with us. When did that happen? At the communion table. He said, take, eat, this is my body. Drink this, this is my blood. In other words, I'm making covenant with you. I'm going to trade places with you. And it was after that he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful in that garden. Right after that, I could die. He took our depression. And so he's hanging on that cross, and you can read the 22nd Psalm as the demons came around him to drag his spirit out of his body. But he had a key. He said, this is what I'm going to do. And the 22nd Psalm, he takes you through his journey, through hell, all the way to the other side, praising God in the great congregation. And only when he, he said that whole psalm, then he closed it. It is finished. And he cried with a loud voice. And he gave up the ghost. It means that he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It means I deposit all that I am into your instrument, into your law. And he fulfilled all the law and the prophets. And so he went into hell. And after three days and nights, suddenly Satan thought he had won. But after three days and nights, the Lord called down into that pit and said, Thy throne, O God, is forever. Let all the angels worship you. And the Holy Ghost stormed down through the caverns of the damned with the glory of God and set himself and spread himself upon the Son of God. And started raising him with power from the dead. Satan and all the demons would have begun to yell, Yes, you can't have him. That's sin. That's sin. And then the mystery would have been revealed. Yes, it is sin. But it's not his sin. It's their sin. The sin stays. But he comes out. And he was raised with great power. That's why he came out of that tomb and said, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. Now you go and cast out the devil. You lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You do this. Because now when you receive him as Lord, you're his body. You become one with him. And he's in covenant with his father. So you're in covenant with the almighty when you make him your Lord. Well, I hope that helps somebody today. That's the truth. And truth hidden is truth rewritten. And truth out of the Bible that's hidden becomes religious truth rewritten. And that's when you start taking a beating and suffer many things from elders, priests, and scribes. That's when you start suffering from those three things. Well, remember, 
once you suffer at the hands of elders, priests, and scribes, telling you how you have to suffer, telling you how you have to do, telling you have to, how you have to do these things. The next thing that follows that is sin and death. You need to remember that. Hallelujah. Well, today you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Well, Brother Robin, now that wasn't everything. I know it. I know it. We're going to tell every little detail of this in an hour. I mean, come on. But we can start and we can progress knowing more of the truth and more of the truth. So keep all this, those things in your thoughts. Ponder them in your heart like Mary used to do things when she would see things about Jesus or something said about it. Said she would keep these things and ponder them in her heart. Let this go over and over in your mind and ask yourself, what has tradition, what has priests and scribes, what have I suffered from this when he suffered for me? Is it God's will that I, I be in pain, I be sick, I be broke, I be poor? Is it God's will? Or is this just something I'm suffering from elders, priests, and scribes? I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. That, but, you know, you have to really think about these things. He said, I'm going to suffer many things of those three and be killed. So death follows that. Death always follows that. So you have to divide John with John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And anything that don't agree with life and more abundant life, then you're just probably suffering from elders, priests, and scribes. So what you want to do is you want to understand, but how do I partake of the life and the more abundant life? With keys. You spend time in the Word. You listen to programs like this. You listen to teaching of the Word. And you go to the Scripture until you get a revelation of it. Not some foolish, asinine thing. That people come, <clears throat> I've heard people tell things like this. Well, when he rose from the dead, everybody just got saved. Everybody just got saved. You don't even have to pray the sinner's prayer anymore. Really? Is that what you believe? Then I guess the Antichrist will be saved too, won't he? Well, I thought everybody got it. Do you know how stupid that is? People stand up and start twisting. You know why that is? Because the truth, like those commandments in Montgomery, was picked up with human hand trucks and rolled into a closet and the door slammed on it. And then somebody over here can say, well, let me tell you what grace means. Grace means that we can sin like heathen, heathenistic dogs out here running around, sweating in the sun, just rolling around like slobbering animals. And everything's okay with us. Well, no, it ain't okay with you. It's a doctrine like that that will cause you to burn, pop, and crackle like a rubber tire through hell one day. It is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead for you. Confess with your mouth that he is your Lord and you shall be saved. That's what you do. Anything that says it's another way is a lie. It's a lie. But the Bible said people will believe a lie and be damned. So you don't want to be damned? No, damn. No, I don't want to be damned. Well, don't be. You know, it's like people say, well, I, want to, I just want to do what's right. I said, well, do it. Then won't you just do it? If you want to do what's right, do what's right. Well, Brother Robin, you ain't, you ain't got every little fact right yet. Really? You didn't have to tell me that. But I'll tell you what. I know that Jesus Christ is the only way. And I won't tell you something I can't show you in this word. Hallelujah.
Well, I could go on and on. Man, I'm just now getting started. I mean, I could really preach now. Hallelujah. Come on, Krista, and let's tell the people how to prosper, give them opportunity to give. And people say, well, what do I give? Whatever the Lord tells you, it'll be more than enough. Whatever it is, it'll be more than enough. Just do whatever he says do. Well, he didn't tell me to give 50 cents. Well, then that's what I do. Obedience is better than sacrifice. That's right. Just be obedient. It'll be more than enough for you and for anything else the ministry would use it for. Hallelujah. Amen.